Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. So, whew, <laughs> taking a minute. Um, at first glance, our topics, ethnicity and gender, uh, really appear to have little to do with one another, or at least not enough to present a conjoined paper to all of you. Um, but both of our problems ultimately lie in the disciplinary separation of Romanists and anglo saxonists and uh, perceived 5th century divide uh, because the assumptions about the nature of the end of, the Ro of Roman Britain and the economic approaches to this uh, shape how uh, uh, the economic approaches to this end shape how we read material culture. Um, there is, of course, the long-standing assumption of a stark and binary cultural divide between Roman Britain and Anglo-Saxon England, supposedly reflected in the material culture and in its use by peoples and societies across the divide. And in studies of gender, because material culture is often identified and discussed in ethnic terms belonging to either a Roman, uh, Roman British and sub-Roman or Anglo-Saxon context, uh, there has been little work on and thus explanation for the transition of gender expression and its spread from one period to the next. Now a properly intersectional approach surely recognizes that gender, ethnicity, other identity categories and the material conditions that shape them as well cannot <coughs> be treated in isolation. Rather, they frame one another, forming interlocking sections of broader patterns of ideological transformation. Likewise, such intersections frame our own discursive assumptions about the material that we analyse. And I think Nick Studley's justly celebrated the spindle and the sphere forms now quite old forms a classic example of this. Um, Studley, though his st studies on um, how uh, Anglo-Saxon gender kits construct distinct gender categories in early Anglo-Saxon England is a marvellous piece of work. It nevertheless reifies a distinct category of Germanic peoples identifiable by biological characteristics, whose, based on the work of his earlier supervisor Heinrich Hecker, um, whose uh, migration, he argues, produced a frontier society like the American colonial frontier, and in which the Amer gendered norms of the so-called colonists were transformed, and that's the sort of narrative that I think, given the events in the United States today, requires reflecting on whoever's producing it. Um, Likewise, Bonnie Ephros has commented on the gendered assumptions about social roles that um, shape our inference of ethnic identity from material culture, largely used for such readings in the so-called migration period, largely dress items buried with women. Toby Martin's more subtle takes, meanwhile, uh, grant those often identified by archaeologists as women a more active role in the shaping of such ethnic identities, but this work reifies um, such identities as coherent constructs that these women could be shaping. Um, so the necessity of tackling these concerns and the problems of these approaches to them hand in hand should thus be obvious. So we'll begin with my work on ethnicity. And the focus of my work is uh, the discursive assumptions that in lieu of empirical demonstration, I argue in my doctoral thesis, govern our interpretative approach to the period. And primarily these discursive assumptions concern narratives of rupture, dislocation, ethnic replacement. And whether that ethnic replacement takes place through literal population transfer or more subtle processes of acculturation, cultural change, I argue in this thesis is somewhat irrelevant because ultimately, and this is the case in any assertion of absolute truth with these kinds of questions, the same non-empirical assumptions underlie the discussion, as we want to demonstrate through a few brief examples. And I don't want to draw out or quote these. These are from scholars of a range of different positions, many of whom I largely agree with. But um, these, I could pull out a million other quotes this kind of example, but this is to make the point that there's a discourse here, and I think that these three quotes, they're all from relatively recent publications from <coughs> scholars, epitomise the main stage at which argumentation moves from empiricism to interpretive leaps, which is necessary in all archaeological analysis. But this is what in Derridean philosophy are called a poriae, um, and in this case it hinges upon the assumption, and it is an assumption, that certain kinds of artefacts with a geographical origin in, or that make stylistic reference to, northern Germania and Scandinavia convey a form of coherent Germanicness that would have been meaningful to this material culture's users, and was used to construct ethnic groups in opposition to the putative Romanness that preceded them. And I don't think this is where I'm, what I'm going to argue that that claim is reasonable. Um, it relies upon a historiographical concept of the Germanic that has long since been shown to be a 19th century construct. Um, it depends upon assumptions about people or stress. It's often through layers and layers of articles and argumentation, but it depends upon assumptions about people or stress and weapon burial on the continent and their relation to an ethnic folk costume, often called trucked, that have been kind of discredited by such scholars on the continent as Philip Honor and William Hubert Fair. Um, 
Even the claim that early Anglo-Saxon brooches were used to fasten peat plus dress, a sort of tubular gown, um, in the early 5th century, it can't be reasonably argued until around AD 46075, when the transition from cremation to inhumation burial uh, enables us to infer the positioning of grave goods and then the possible gendering of them. Uh, now that this material migrated is indisputable, granted, and it is this that um, some scholars, not all the ones in that quote, to be fair, um, often use as their counter-argument against those of us who query ethnic interpretations, but that equates those of us who doubt that this material expressed ethnicity with processionist arguments about exogenous versus endogenous change, made in the 1980s and 90s, and those aren't the arguments being made today, they're different, of a different nature, because simply pointing out that migration took place does not explain why early Anglo-Saxon material culture became so popular in lowland Britain. Um, that a new form of emergent ethnic consciousness might explain this is merely an interpretative assertion, which, though possible, hasn't been empirically proven. And I believe this assertion is in attempt to contemporary ethnic sociology, which um, shows that although patterned phenomena uh, can be identified as ethnic expression in some instances, uh, this cannot be universalized. So the similar apparent patterns of phenomena cannot be assumed to represent ethnic expression in all instances without some means of proving this, and we lack those means for our material. A Bordeauxian habitus framework, Alishan Jones, in our archaeology of ethnicity, doesn't get us anywhere without some indication of the processes the material are engaged in, like domestic architecture in Romans, in Sean Jones's case. So what might we say instead? It is uncontroversial that the decorative styles found on so-called early Germanic metalwork do have the same stylistic origins in grammar and provincial Roman military metalwork, such as that found in row graves in northern Gaul, and I'm far from the first person to say this, of course. Um, but the preservation of these grammatical frameworks is simply more mediated, so surely the question we should be asking <coughs> is not which proto-ethnic Germanic peoples uh, brought this metalwork to Britain, but why did this additional step of mediation occur? Why did this material come to Britain from the barbaricum? And we'll try to tie in all that together to produce an answer at the end, but first we need to turn to gender and cat. So Okay. All right. So, uh, my current PhD research focuses on gender, <laughs> as you may have deduced. Um, in particular, possible instances of cross-gendered graves in early Anglo-Saxon England. Males buried with feminine dress items, beads and brooches, and females buried with weapons. Uh, though I really focus more so on the former. Um, my research has shown a peak in male burials with feminine items in the 6th century in line with the conclusion Studley came to during his Spindle and the Spear gender inquiry, whereas according to Andrew Welton's research at the University of Florida, female burials with weapons peaked in the 7th century. But my numbers and Andrew's numbers, while independently reached, indicate an overall presence of the phenomenon or phenomena across the early period in somewhere between 5 and 8 percent of inhumation burials. And there's been some like um, earlier work done on it, but the, the, the numbers were so crazily different and uh, attention was so slight towards it that, that I just thought that that was a good topic for my dissertation. So here we are. Um, so around 3% of these burials may originate sometime in the mid to late 5th century. Uh, but tracing this measure of gender flexibility back further, as well as attempting to understand it within the larger context of uh, a changing post-Western Roman world becomes difficult for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, of course, is cremation burial. The initial dominant, right, uh, the initial dominant early Anglo-Saxon burial rite. Uh, this is a rite in which remains are purposefully destroyed, and as a result, one in which the remains can also be more difficult for the osteologist to sex. Though, unfortunately, even when they are sexed with a degree of certainty, the osteologist's conclusions are less likely to be trusted than those regarding inhumations. Um, at Cleetham, however, uh, there are several instances of males being buried with objects like spindle whorls or what might be considered an unusual number of beads. Um, in inhumation burial, anything over two, according to Studley, and five, according to Helen Geek, is considered feminine, uh, though one here has as many as 50, actually. Cleetham Grave 468. Um, at Spung Hill, eight cremations were found to have sword fittings. Uh, one could be assigned to a male, but two were inhumed with females, or inurned, rather, with females. Um, 
A second reason that attempting to understand this phenomenon within the larger context is hard is that studying before early Anglo-Saxon England into the Roman period, uh, we hit a wall, this divide. Um, so now stick with me. Um, in the early 2000s, Dr. Pete Wilson and his team announced to the media a certain discovery. While excavating in Catterick in the north of England, archaeologists had discovered two unusual burials um, for, from the 4th century, which have since been termed transgressive. One was a 20 to 25 year old male, skeleton 952. Uh, this individual was not deviant. Uh, they were buried with their head to the west. They were not decapitated or prone, and they occupied their grave singly. Just like a woman of the period, they were buried with a necklace, bracelets, and a braided jet anklet. In this period, as in early Anglo-Saxon England, bead necklaces um, are almost exclusively attributable to women. But in subsequent articles, 952 was called a gallus, a eunuch priest to the goddess Sibylle. The jet of their anklet was supposed to have amuletic properties, and they were buried with two pebbles in their mouth, an act that Martin Wainwright claimed was a, quote, symbol of the loss of virility and had been placed in the gallus' mouth in case he regretted in the afterlife his devotion to the goddess. So the author here refers to the individual 952 as he, but of course this is a problematic assertion given that we're incapable of determining the motivation for cross-dressing in this instance. Um, therefore, first, first of all, rather than taking this individual for what they are most simply, a male buried with feminine items, scholarship makes excuses for what today might be described as non-normative behavior, creating a magical religious category in which the individual can exist as feminine without being a woman. Um, but second of all, while inhumation 952 was found in an area with a strong military presence and also rich in Anglo-Saxon material, this transgression has been discussed in terms of Romano-British practice and practice within the Roman world overall. It has never before been examined or related to possible cross-gendered burials that could be removed potentially by less than 100 years um, in the timeline, existing among a litany of other locations as little as 25 miles east, in nor uh, east to Norton or 50 miles south uh, in West Hesslerton, if not closer. So that arrow is the approximate location of Catterick. Um, it has also not been discussed in relation to other close continental examples, such as Enery 32 um, in northern Gaul, but rather in relation to practices that germinated in Asia Minor. Why? Um, my suspicion is this gulf, the classical medieval divide. Um, so those are the grave goods, by the way, that Enery was buried with, or that uh, grave 32, rather, was buried with. But um, in any case, Guy Halsall argues for a shift in gender expression in the Roman Empire, beginning in the 4th and 5th centuries, away from a one-gender system where the pinnacle was the civic male, and toward a martial form of masculinity, one which had been initially perceived as unrestrained and barbarous. The valorization of that which originally might be considered womanly, or at least decidedly unmasculine, um, uh, unwittingly, quote, enabled more actively idealized feminine traits to emerge based more strongly around sex, the body, and reproduction, and thus not simply dependent upon the emulation of the male, unquote. This, he reasons, can be seen physically expressed in furnish inhumation with the use of gendered grave kits and in its performance, the display of the dead, feasting, etc. And though he focuses in particular on Merovingian Gaul, Housel proposes that the spread of furnish inhumation across the wider Western Empire in the late 5th through to the early 6th centuries, so a bit later, um, was the result of social insecurity caused by the deposition um, about the status of the West following uh, Odoacer's deposition of Romulus Augustus in AD 476. But we witness increasingly across the 5th century as martial forms of masculinity were increasingly introduced into the political sphere, encapsulated nicely by Stilicho here, um, increased interest across the entire Western Empire in the expression of status through martial display in funerary practice, which scholars such as Bonnie Ross, again, Philip von Rommel, have also observed. Um, the development of gendered grave kits and Anglo-Saxon funerary performance may perhaps 
a little earlier on, so we have to explain this, but bear with us, have been similarly inspired and maintained by social or political instability. The gendering of cruciform brooches, the gendering of two brooch burial more widely, seemingly began in Lowland Britain in the later 5th century, as did the use of style one decoration, of course. But... This is a conjecture. Um, but there is an irrefutable value of the feminine display uh, uh, displayed in 5th and 6th century Anglo-Saxon grave kits that while particularly in association with the biological female and her reproductive value, as shown in the strong correlation between female age and grave wealth, may have been an environment in which a measure of gender flex flexibility was able to flourish, unrestrained or at least less restrained by strict notions of masculinity or to a lesser extent feminine. Femininity. Um, as previously mentioned, an increase in cross-gendered burials can, in fact, be seen in the 6th century. Yeah, perhaps earlier, and this is where we're going to try something tentative, so bear with us. Earlier changes, too, might be related to these transformations of normative gender expectations. And that earlier in the 5th century, these early 5th century cremation burials can be associated with these wider transformative changes is disputed, and not without good reason, because the major change that takes place is this mass expansion of cremation burial, uh, using a specific type of cremation urn, also found in continental sites in the Barbaricum, such as Isengolf and Suda Barbaricum, were, of course, well researched by scholars such as Howard. Um, now, can this model still be applied to cremation in the formative decades of Anglo-Saxon England? Um, weapons burial is especially scarce in Anglo-Saxon cremation burial, found in less than 1% of cremations, while occupying almost one out of every five inhumations. Items and offerings also may have had a much weaker gender association. Horse burials, for example, were found with male and female burials, but became confined to the masculine in the 6th century. Uh, Squires reasoned that gender may not have been a primary concern during this period, taking a back seat to other forms of identity expression. So secure social organization like that in Denmark may be responsible for a lack of gender display in their burials, which likewise have only 1 to 2 percent containing weapons. And of course many of these cremation urns also contain melted fragments of early cruciform brooches or nudan brooches bearing Roman military styles, the earliest forms of which were buried alongside Roman military metalwork on the continent in inhumation burials. Um, but we can't assume that in these earlier burials they were used in a form of gendered peoplos costume, as is often alleged, without back projecting from the later 5th century furnished inhumation burials. So we therefore can't identify a gendered use of those items, but perhaps gender can be found somewhere else in Anglo-Saxon England, and that's in the cremation parts themselves. So this is tentative, but I sorted the unparalleled in scale cremation on corpus from Spung Hill according to a new typology developed by Gareth Perry. And Perry demonstrates, con well, he argues, I think convincingly, contrary to previous arguments that see these urns as purely funerary, but they may, many of them, at least in Cleetham and Elsham, might <coughs> have been used in fermentation processes used to make butter or beer using a form of what he calls use wear analysis. Well, not what he calls, what is called. Um, so his typology is based upon the perceived functionality of respective urn forms, and that is derived from ethnographic observations that might be problematic. So we could unpack that later if you like. Um, but in any case, I cross-reference this new typology with uh, slide, please, with um, the osteoarchaeological <laughs> data. So this is the typology, and then I cross-reference this with the osteoarchaeological data and found a statistically significant trend of urns that Perry argues are appropriate to production processes, fermentation, etc., with <coughs> female bones. We don't have time to discuss the implications of this at length, but although in the early 5th century gendering did still generally proceed, upon the basis of a constituted lack from an idealised form of normative masculinity, maybe in Britain new forms of gendered expression were beginning in opposition to this normative framework, uh, some of which may have pertained to militaristic feasting activity, and I relied heavily on the arguments of such scholars as Williams and Squires in drawing out this, but I don't have time to go into detail today. Um, if we accept that both furnished inhumation and cremation rites were a response to social instability, and if Perry's new typology and the implications of his use wear analysis can be extended to Spunk Hill, granted those are both very big ifs, um, then early Anglo-Saxon England maybe had gendered rites which resemble processes taking place elsewhere across the empire, but with very clear localised differences, mainly this is the material from Northern Germania. So, this had a material basis though, withdrawing from the empire uh, ended access to the mass-produced continental military metalwork made in continental fabric hay, and maybe this will be a couple of slides back, please. Oh, a couple of slides back. Cool. Okay. Um, and maybe <laughs> this might be sufficient to explain a turn toward the North Sea, because we can't treat identity transformation separately from the economic base, right? 
the usual consensus about Roman Britain's end is that it was a process of drastic economic collapse brought about by Constantine III's use of patience, which exacerbated economic decline in the later 4th century, ending the tax pay cycle and a consequent collapse of urbanism. Uh, James Gerard, of course, though, points out that th those who favour this interpretation place too much emphasis on archaeologically visible material, and so the disappearance of archaeologically visible ma Roman material culture is also vital to dating early Anglo-Saxon material and applying identity labels to it. So, next slide, please. Privileging the disappearance of this kind of high-status material leads us to identify a binary set of Roman versus Germanic elite material culture groups, defined by apparent orderedness of the Roman relative to Germanic. And I had a look at Waspington and found that so most of these graves aligned west-east um, are largely defined as Roman versus a kind of uh, Anglo-Saxon family here aligned north-south. The vast majority of those west-east burials are dated purely on the basis of their alignment. Um, a few have hobnailed loops and so are dated to the late 4th, early 5th century. The vast majority, there are possible reasons to believe that maybe some of these clustered around the north-south burials. There's reason to believe they might be related to one another and maybe they shouldn't be treated as so separately and other from one another as we often assume as I've argued in a recent article. Um, so material and ideological expression are governed, we've just got two paragraphs left, are governed <laughs> by the availability of material and ideological resources and both of these in Lowland Britain were drastically altered by the end of imperial rule and moreover many of the changes which take place in Britain find parallels in northern Gaul such as in uh, this cemetery at Vron. Uh, such as the arrivement of new settlements and artifact features, reputed to the Germanic characteristics, widespread economic contraction, which has been equally reconsidered, like James Gerard has done, by Paul Van Ossel. Um, so maybe these regions underwent similar processes, which explains both the Scandinavian and German material found in Britain and the Northern Gallic Rhine grader. And sometimes you get the same material, so maybe this material wasn't seen as so different by those using it. Northern Gaul and Lowland Britain were comparably impoverished provinces, with imperial rule collapsing early in the 5th century. Without the stability of the Roman Empire, new possibilities for identity expression may have become available. Uh, Cross-gendered burial expression could continue even flourish uh, after the final collapse of the imperial system in the West more widely in the late 5th and 6th centuries. These changes are always presented as entirely new, a replacement of the prior system because of the obvious dramatic events relating to the movement of peoples from nor northern Germania. But they don't need to be. They express concerns other, uh, others bearing their dead in the Western Roman Empire shared. Some specific aspects of these new modes of expression may have pre-5th century precedents. Treating both gender and ethnicity as fluid, malleable, rather than fixed categories, something that still persists even while acknowledging that these things are social constructs, we, um, ooh, we might find ways to bridge the fifth century divide. <laughs>